The Tales from the Pizzaplex book series ran for about 14 and a half months, but now the final book in the series, book 8, titled B72, has come out. In what was already a very packed October month with the FNAF movie, New Among Us map, Super Mario Wonder, and Marvel Spider-Man 2 all coming out, what a surprise that the month gave us even more. In this video, I'll be discussing all the theories I have about the new book. I have stuff to talk about for each story, so I'll do brief summaries of each story. If you want a more detailed look at the stories, be sure to check out all four of my individual summary videos for the stories in the book. But without further ado, let's get talking about the Final Tales book. B-7-2 follows Billy after getting crushed in the car compactor at the end of B-7. He ends up in the hospital and begins healing from his injuries with all the foreign metal objects and stuff he added to himself from the first B-7 being removed. Those pieces of wires and metal accumulate and become an agony creature, beginning to taunt Billy and try to merge with him again. Billy ends up leaving the hospital and living with his grandma, trying to find himself and discovering he wants to be a writer. However, Billy's grandma had been trying to protect Billy from the remains of B-7, and B-7 begins to merge with her because it can't be with Billy anymore. However, Billy's grandma was dying, and when B7 merged with her, it was now attached to a dying body, so it and Billy's grandma end up dying together, with Billy eventually moving on, getting new prosthetic limbs, and hoping to become a writer. At some point in the future, I plan to do a video about the original B7, and the main idea I have for it is sort of that it's a metaphor for William Afton. Billy in B7 is basically a human who wants to be, and believes he is, a robot, which matches William Afton, and on top of that, Billy is a short form of the name William. So I think the connection here is definitely intentional, so if Billy is sort of a metaphor for William, then what does this story have to do with William? I have two different ideas. This story begins with Billy being in the hospital, just like after in the man in room 1280, and there's an agony creature made from Billy that tries to reconnect with him. After William dies in the man in room 1280, Eleanor, an agony being created from William's crimes, forms the Afton amalgamation with a bunch of agony infected objects just like B7, and Afton is also a part of this, merged with the agony created from his crimes but this ends up being a failure and later that agony creature is unable to connect with William and it ends up dying following that. This pretty well matches B7 here, the agony of Billy trying to reconnect with Billy, failing and later dying. Another connection it may have could be to Glitchtrap. It's pretty well established at this point that Glitchtrap is not the real spirit of Afton but rather the mimic replicating his crimes. Say in this case that B7 connects with Glitchtrap. Burn Trap is what becomes of Glitch Trap, with Glitch Trap connecting to a new endoskeleton and the spring bonnie suit as well as a corpse. It's entirely possible that the corpse on Burn Trap is the corpse of William Afton, but I personally believe that he's either completely gone or still trapped in Ultimate Custom Night. In that case, Glitch Trap, the mimic, would still be trying to reconnect with the real Afton but is unable to, so it just connects with the spring bonnie suit, and while the real Afton is there, at the same time he isn't. I don't really know if either of these ideas actually do make sense, but I feel like they can. I don't know if they're meant to tell us anything, if they are intentional, but it's just something I thought was interesting. Something else interesting about the story is that Billy wants to grow up and become a writer. What's interesting about that is that Billy decided to become a robot after watching the Freddy and Friends TV show when he was younger. In Security Breach and Ruin, there's quite a bit of Freddy and Friends imagery throughout the Pizzaplex. This is just an idea, but is it possible that he could have grown up and become the CEO of Fazbear Entertainment? We know Mr. Burroughs is the board chairman, but that's different from a CEO, and while there doesn't have to be a CEO if there's a board chairman, there still can be. Again, I don't know if it's true, but this video is just to get you guys thinking, so yeah. Moving on, let's just talk about Alone Together. Alone Together is about a kid named Travis who is pretty much a loner. In his woodshop class, he decides to do a project that will be pretty difficult called the Mechanical Turk, which basically makes an automaton play chess with a real person. Person. In reality, there's just someone inside the cabinet of the machine controlling it. Travis decides to turn his automaton into the Sunman from the Pizzaplex, and his dad agrees to help him. He also meets a new girl and tries to befriend her, but she didn't like him much and didn't want to be friends. He begins getting dreams and visions of what he learns to be a ghost of a kid who made the same project as him about two years ago. He wants to find the body of this ghost kid so they can get closure, so he searches storage rooms in his school to find the mechanical Sunman device. He finds a sectioned off shed and finds the mechanical Sunman, but inside he finds the dead body of the kid and he finds that he was the ghost all along. So his ghost ends up being trapped in the machine along with his dead body. Alone Together is similar to Coming Home in a few ways. In both stories, the main character believes they are still alive when in reality they are dead, and the people around them know they're dead, but they can feel the presence of them still there. Both stories seem to indicate that when people die, they forget that they are dead. They can be reminded, but initially they think they're still alive. In the fourth closet, Susie talks about how she doesn't remember what happened after Bonnie took her away. 
indicating that missing children are examples of spirits not knowing they're dead. If that's the case, then do other spirits also believe they're still alive? Charlotte seems to be the most aware and probably knows she's dead, and Jake and Andrew do remember that they are dead. It seems to only be under specific circumstances that spirits don't know they're dead. Travis's grandma tells Travis that spirits stay in areas familiar to them and cannot be set free if their bodies aren't found and if their murder wasn't solved. Since the missing kids' bodies are hidden and Afton is not definitively discovered to be the murderer, the missing kids stay around. It's unclear, but it's possible that this is also tied to whether or not they remember their past, and the reason Charlotte would remember that she's dead is because while Afton isn't known to be the one who killed her, she doesn't seem to be missing and instead simply dies and is probably found. I don't know if this is tied to the memory thing, but it's the only idea I have, so let me know what you guys think it could be. The story is also similar in some ways to Find Player 2, as both are about someone trying to find out what happened to someone who died years ago, and eventually getting trapped with the body of that person. Something else to talk about is how this story connects to the FNAF 4 nightmares. It's well established by now that Michael Afton is the player of FNAF 4 from the Survival Logbook, the FNAF 1 phone call, and many Fazbear Fright stories all indicating that to be the case. However, the biggest question about this is exactly why and how Mike has the nightmares. And there's an idea I've had for a while that I think Alone Together actually indicates. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you'll know that I personally believe that the FNAF 4 nightmares are caused by the bite victim. It's implied that the bite victim went through the nightmares considering the purple telephone and the FNAF 4 bedroom is tied with him, and it is said in the logbook that he apparently has dreams indicating that he went through the nightmares. I always believed that since Mike was the player of FNAF 4, it's entirely possible that the bite victim was like a ghost around Mike, sharing his memories with Michael and Michael's own experiences merging with those of the bite victim. I think Alone Together is meant to further indicate this idea. I think it's now more likely than it was before that the bite victim experienced the nightmares and his memories were shared with Michael, just like how Travis's grandma tells him that ghosts can share memories with people that they are around. Speaking of FNAF 4 being explained though, let's talk about Dittophobia, probably the most talked about story since the Mimic came out. Dittophobia is about a young boy named Rory who is unable to find his way out of his house every day and is never able to find his parents. He always gets really tired very quickly after the morning and heads to bed. He then has nightmares about a monstrous and tattered bear, bunny, chicken, and fox who always get to him. He repeats the same day over and over, and eventually he actually finds that he wakes up feeling great, noticing he hadn't had any nightmares the night before. However, when he looks around his house that day, he not only finds it to be completely filthy, he finds himself to have aged from a 7-year-old boy to a 17 year old teenager. He learns that his whole life was fake and that it had all been an experiment with mannequins affected by hallucinogenic gas to experiment with constant fear in children. Rory finds his way out of the fake house and manages to contact his friend Wade who gets him up to speed and Wade tells Rory that based on the information Rory gave him in order to get out of this facility, which by the way is a sister location bunker, he has to find a generator to divert the power and get the elevator working to escape. So, he finds it, but it triggers a tape from William Afton telling him he has no life and Rory's like, he's right, I'll stay here. And he does, and that's the end. This story pretty much blatantly tells us that the Nightmare animatronics are real and that they're mannequins that basically run on tracks, heading towards the FNAF 4 bedroom. They're not real monsters or nightmares, they're just mannequins. Rory's house is basically a simulated house, which seems to run along with the same trend that many Tales from the Pizza Box stories have. You know, the whole thing about fake or altered realities. The story also tells us that Afton experimented with fear, which makes sense given what we know about him. And since I talked before about the bite victim almost definitely experiencing the nightmares, I think it's clear that the bite victim was an experiment victim just like Rory was. And that's probably at least one of the reasons why the bite victim was afraid of the animatronics. I do think there's probably more to it than just that, given the don't you remember what you saw line, indicating something more than just an experience, but this would definitely be part of why he's afraid of the animatronics. Something else interesting to note is that every night when Rory goes to sleep, he puts on pajamas, but what is interesting about this is that those pajamas are black and white striped, just like the shirt the bite victim wears. This could be meant to indicate that the bite victim was placed in this room before, and that these clothes were originally his. Sister location is also abandoned in this story. I think it would make sense that William experimented on the bite victim first in 1983, and then began experimenting on Rory. After that, I think there's a couple different ideas that could be true, and it depends on when Elizabeth's death takes place in the timeline. It's implied that Elizabeth's death was directly followed by Circus Babies Entertainment and Rental opening up, as I discussed in my second timeline video. And if that's the case, Rory must have gotten out of the 
chamber at some point after Elizabeth died, as the fun times are in Circus Baby's entertainment and rental already. What's very interesting is the fact that Rory is in the experiment rooms for 10 years, and Sister Location tells us that the experiment rooms began in 1983. That means, no matter what, Rory was placed in the experiment rooms in 1983 at the earliest, which confirms that since the animatronics are still there and not entered during Didophobia, Sister Location is after FNAF 1, as FNAF 1 is 10 years after 1983 in 1993. It's either possible that Rory began being experimented on right after the bite victim, and that Elizabeth also died up to a couple years after or right before the bite victim, then Rory got out of the experiments around the time of FNAF 1, which would indicate that not long after Circus Baby's Entertainment and Rental opened, it shut down again. Then, probably when it was revealed that Rory was still alive, William returned and reopened and fixed up the facility, turning it into the version of it that we see in Sister Location. What's interesting to note is that the animatronics are kind of broken up, and the facility is slightly different with the hallways replacing vents. It's possible that it was either fixed up, or that William later added hallucinogenic gas going through the whole location, which makes Mike view it slightly differently than it actually is. The events definitely still happened, but it's possible gas made it seem like the hall always were vents and that the animatronics and the rest of the facility were clean and not broken. Another option could be that Elizabeth died a bit later in the timeline, like around after FNAF 1, and that Rory was experimented on starting then, and Afton abandoned the location because he'd gotten springlocked with sister location just happening a bit later than we originally thought it did, and Rory escaping around the early 2000s. This option suits my beliefs on when Elizabeth died, but it doesn't really make sense that the animatronics don't attack Rory but do attack Michael. It's possible though, it just requires a couple stretches to make work. At the moment, I don't have a specific belief, but I may switch over to the former side. I'd understand either one though, though I'd expect more of you guys to pick the former as well. I also want to go back to the thing about how the Nightmare Animatronics are real. What's important to note is that the hallucinogenic gas doesn't actually make the Nightmare Animatronics look the way that they do, it simply makes it look like they're moving smoothly like actual monstrous animatronics. We know this because when Rory is free of the gas, he still sees the nightmares the same way. In this case, what exactly is Plush Trap? The Fright Story out of stock has the Plush Trap Chaser which is a real toy and operates just like Plush Trap does in FNAF 4. For this reason, I think Plush Trap is an actual Plush Trap Chaser, though probably before they were mass produced. One other thing to mention about the Nightmares is that while Rory and Mike's experiences are similar, they aren't exactly the same. In Didophobia, instead of Foxy running into the room, he starts in the closet. Instead of Freddy being behind Rory, he blocks Rory's escape in front of him and Rory doesn't get out of bed to close the doors and defend himself. The reason in FNAF 4 that Foxy runs into the room, the reason why Freddy spawns from behind us, and the reason we can get up and close the doors is because of Mike's experiences in FNAF 1, where Freddy gets into the office and comes from behind you, where Foxy runs into the room, and where we can close the doors to stop animatronics. Because of all that, like I said, the bite victim's experiences kind of merge with Mike's, which is what creates the gameplay that we go through in FNAF 4. Next what I want to talk about is how this story might connect to Ultimate Custom Night. I talk about my full opinions on Ultimate Custom Night and the candidacy of the Frasma Frights books in a video from a few months ago, and my opinion is basically that FNAF 6 is a split point in the timeline that leads into the Pizzaplex era and the Frights epilogues respectively, and individually. Every element of the story of Frights that happened prior to FNAF 6 takes place in the game's timeline, and I think that Andrew and Cassidy are both ones that torture Afton in Ultimate Custom Night. Andrew is the one you should not have killed, and Cassidy is the vengeful spirit, the one who talks through the mediocre melodies. Andrew's existence in the game's timeline is a bit of a controversial idea as it's a bit difficult to place him. We don't exactly know when Andrew was killed for certain, but one option could be that he was an experiment victim. Maybe the bite victim and Rory weren't the only ones. Maybe Andrew was one too. It would explain why they torture him through nightmares just like the ones Afton experimented on them with. The reason I say them is because it's possible that both Andrew and Cassidy were experiment victims. It could just be Andrew, just Cassidy, or both, but I think it makes sense that at least one of them was. The reason I think both are good options comes from the endo rooms from Security Breach. In one of the images in the endo rooms, we can see what looks to be Cassidy lying down, afraid, in the FNAF 4 bed. Since there's an X and a gash on this door, many people have interpreted this as showing Cassidy not to be the bite victim. However, the gash on the door is meant to allude to the gashes on the walls inside the room behind the door, and the X's on these doors represent things the endos aren't supposed to do. It could very well be a meta clue that Cassidy isn't the bite victim, but at the same time, what if it's meant to show us that Cassidy was an experiment victim? In the Vengeful Spirit's voice lines from Ultimate Custom Night, they say, This is how it feels, and you get to experience it over and over and over again, forever. I will never let you leave. 
This indicates that the vengeful spirit was put into nightmares by William as they claim to be showing him how it feels. They also said he gets to experience it over and over again, just like Rory does in Didophobia. I don't know, maybe not, but I think it makes sense. It would explain why they're so vengeful to William as well. I also should say that I don't think that Cassidy would have died from the experiments, but I do think that she could have been a part of them and maybe removed from them like the bite victim was. And finally, Epilogue 8. There's not as much to talk about for this one. Lucy in this epilogue pretty much just decides that she should try to get the Mimic springlocked, so she clears out all the suits in the costume room and the Mimic gets springlocked, then she deactivates it and she works for hours and gets out. Pretty simple. There are a few things in this epilogue to talk about though. First of all, a pretty minor thing, when Lucy is thinking about destroying the Mimic, she thinks about how he isn't an invincible supervillain, which kind of reminds me of how in GGY, Gregory changes Tony's story and the new story involves an animatronic supervillain, which is probably referring to the Mimic. I don't know if that was intentional, but it's something that I noticed. But I think the other two things I noticed in this epilogue are much more interesting. First of all, we have a detail that I don't think is 100% definitive, but I think it is most likely intentional because it just adds up really well. When the Mimic is trying to climb out of the Jester's springlock suit, a piece of the springlock suit ends up breaking off the suit and conforms to his head. In Ruin, there's a strange object on the side of the Mimic's face. Some have speculated that it's a piece of burn trap suit, assuming he is the Mimic. Some have suggested that it's just a random piece of a costume or a random design detail, but I feel like it being the same piece of the Jester Springlock suit that stuck to the Mimic's head in the books just makes sense. And the final thing to talk about is regarding the costumes that are in Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Place. I made a theory a few months ago about why I think that FNAF 6 is Fredbear's Family Diner, and I still think that's quite likely. Since FNAF 6 doesn't really align with having costumes like these ones, I think these costumes that the Mimic wears that are in the costume rooms and backstage area of the pizza place actually are left over from Fredbear's Family Diner. However, beyond just that, this story indicates that a theory I came up with for Fredbear's Family Diner a couple months ago may actually be true. You can check out the video yourself if you want to, in fact I recommend it because it's honestly one of my favorite theories I've ever come up with, if not my favorite. The gist is that Fredbear started with no animatronics or springlock suits and instead just originally had costumes, the ones in the pizza place, and as were shown in the Mimic story, Edwin, though probably Henry with the first wave, was tasked with transforming these costumes into animatronics. The costumes that were left over and weren't turned into animatronics are the ones that the Mimic wears in the Mimic story, the epilogues, and Ruin. The costumes used to make the original four Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy originated at Fredbear's, which is why Phone Guy claims them to be 20 years old. The springlock suits were relatively new when they were shut down, and they were made after the costumes started being transformed. The springlock suits were most likely made entirely brand new, or at least Fredbear was, as Fredbear originally was just the regular Freddy. In that case, it's possible some of the other Springlock suits were made entirely new. The reason I'm bringing this up is because of what Lucia notices about the suits in the pizza place. She notes that the Springlock suit is really old, which allows her to pry it open and stick her head inside. However, it's noted that while the Springlock suit is old, it's not as old as the rest of the costumes. This would add up with the Fredbear idea, as it aligns with the Springlock suits not being as old as the fabric costumes. This isn't a massive piece of evidence for the theory, but it's sort of a proof of concept showing that the theory definitely works and I think it's interesting. But that's everything there is to talk about in this video. I hope you guys enjoyed and if you did make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you want to. This is actually going to be my last FNAF theory for a while as for the next week or so I'll be doing Marvel Spider-Man 2 videos. I said this in videos before but I'll say it again that while you obviously don't have to you guys definitely should check out my Marvel Spider-Man 2 videos when they come out because I'm certain that they'll be really fun and I think you guys will probably and hopefully agree. Either way the next theory will probably be on the FNAF movie after it comes out but that's only if it has enough to theorize about to apply to the games. But anyways, that's all, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye guys!